Uh, what we'll do, um, we'll just start off with Aldrich and Elliot to kind of go through the, um, the, the whole picture of the water uh, infrastructure improvement project. And then afterwards, it, um, we can get the state. Um, feel free to, at the end of it, you know, explain to everybody the importance of you know, why we came to this and, and, and the steps that the town needs to take. Um, you know, to keep our operating license, so that type of, so, um, so I'll turn it over to Wayne. Good evening, welcome. Uh, as Chris said, this is the uh, second uh, public information meeting tonight here for the bond vote. Uh, so the bond vote is next Tuesday, uh, which is November 5th. It's uh, 7, uh, polls are open 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. There are absentee ballots available at the, uh, Town Clerk's Office, the, uh, you can vote at the, the Unified Middle School, so I just kind of encourage everybody to get out and vote next Tuesday. So a little bit about why the project is uh, required here. Uh, the primary uh, goal here is it's a replacement of aging and unreliable water pipes, and it includes uh, automatic uh, control and monitoring improvements to the uh, two existing wells and the two uh, storage tanks. Uh, three of the improvements in this project uh, by the state of Vermont. Um, they're necessary to maintain long-term reliability of the water system. Uh, the state issued a sanitary survey back in April of 2019, and these three items that are included in the project are required to be completed by uh, December of 2020. Uh, the first one is the replacement of the Main Street water line. The second is the Boulevard tank inspection that has been completed, and the uh, Inspection results were positive on that. There's some minor uh, repairs, work that needs to be done on that. So the town is going to be including that in the work. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the uh, last part of that is the uh, automatic control of the two existing wells and the uh, mobile controls for the boulevard and the Gaco water storage tanks. So a little bit about what's included in the uh, water system improvements. Um, a major part of the project, which is a little bit easier to See here, this is a new water line. This is a uh, river street, it's just off the page here. Uh, this is the river, this is Church Street, and then this is uh, Marsh Meadow Road up here. Uh, so, about 2,800, or excuse me, 2,500 feet in New Eight Inch here, which just starts north of the uh, intersection with River Street, heads all the way up Main Street to uh, Marsh Meadow Road. And then there's some uh, work on the side streets, and the primary objective of the work on the side streets is a lot of small diameter galvanized water lines that are poor condition. They were off cross country, uh, they're not in the public right away, uh, pretty hard to get to, and there's been some frequent leaks. So we're looking at um, new water lines on Livery Stable Road and Avon Drive. Those are going to be either two inch or four inch. Uh, those are going to provide domestic. The water lines are going to be located within the public right away, so the cross country lines are going to be gone, uh, abandoned, and eliminated, and people are going to be reconnected uh, within the right away areas. And then small diameter water lines on Densmore, Cushing, and Clifford again, the same thing to clean up the cross country lines. Those are all going to be small diameter, two inch and four inch. Uh, for domestic, those are going to be in the public right away, and everybody's going to be reconnected to those new water lines. Uh, also, with the water line improvements, uh, there's going to be what we call the incidentals and purchases. There's going to be new fire hydrants, new gate valves at each of the intersections. If Tim has a leak on Main Street, you know, he's chasing that back to figure out where he can find a gate valve that works um, to shut things down. So sometimes fairly large areas do need to be shut down if he has a water leak. It's also going to include uh, new water services with the right of way with curb stops. The other parts of the project here, which are a little bit easier to see on this figure, is uh, there's work at the two storage tanks. Uh, as you're coming in, this is to the east, we've got the Boulevard storage tank. As I mentioned, that was recently inspected. There's going to be some exterior cleaning, refinishing of that, also some interior cleaning and refinishing of the tank. There's going to be level controls so the town staff can automatically monitor the water levels in the tank. Uh, same thing up here at the Gaco storage tank. Uh, we're going to run underground power up that. There's going to be automatic uh, level monitoring controls. 
Towns would have the ability to operate the wells automatically. Right now, they run off a timer. Um, they really don't know how much water is to take, so this operations could be much more efficient, uh, much better use of the water, and, and also help improve the water quality in those two storage tanks. In the addition to that, there's going to be operator and sampling improvements over here, uh, off from Pleasant Street. That's also a state um, requirement as part of the sanitary survey. So overall, why are the improvements required? Uh, again, the water mains on Main Street are past their useful life. And if you've seen Tim out there, he's repaired some uh, fairly frequent leaks, and you know that causes shutdown of service to uh, existing businesses and homeowners. Uh, the way that the the uh, wells and the water storage tanks have been operated is somewhat antiquated, um, so that's going to be automated again to provide the staff with more control, better monitoring, uh, and we don't want the water to sit in those tanks too long, so there's going to have a lot more flexibility to be able to move the water through those tanks quicker. Uh, there's a lot of small diameter galvanized water lines in the cross country areas of Liberty Stable, Avon. Uh, Densmore and Clifford, uh, those are going to be abandoned and taken out of service. Uh, and then again, as mentioned, the uh, state is requiring that the three major improvements be done. The water line replacement on Main Street, the monitoring control of the two water storage tanks. And if the town doesn't complete those within the time frame of the compliance schedule, they could be subject to, uh, to future fines. Uh, the total bond amount is $2.8 million. We've had some recent adjustments in the total project cost. Um, the total project cost is pretty close to $2.8 million right now. And because we didn't have the inspection results for the Boulevard storage tank, that's, that works going to be about $140,000. And the town does want to get that included within this work and that bond authorization. Uh, the construction cost is a little bit over $2 million. Uh, then we have a 10 percent construction contingency, there's engineering costs, there's permit fees, uh, legal short-term interest, that's all part of the uh, total project cost, total bond amount of 2.8 million. So what are the available funding sources? Um, all the money is coming from the state. Uh, the good news is there's a projected loan amount of the 2.8 million, about 1 million 50,000. Um, because of the town qualifies for the extended uh, term and the lower interest rate, that's going to be a uh, four-year term at zero percent interest. Uh, and then because of the uh, higher water rates in the town and the uh, median household income, the uh, town also qualifies for what we call the disadvantaged subsidy. So that's that's a million fifty thousand uh, dollars, and that basically the town doesn't have to pay that back. So that's somewhat equivalent to a grant moving forward. The other thing that's out there too, which is the reason why the town, another reason why the town is pushing the bond vote in November, uh, there's additional state subsidy that's available. That's on a first come, first serve basis. Uh, that's 25% of the total project cost, and that comes right off the top. Uh, that's estimated at about 700,000. So if the bond vote passes next week, um, there's no guarantees, but it poises the town a lot better to be able to also uh, tap into those funds. The other part of this too, which has just come up very recently, is because of the galvanized water lines are being replaced, taken out of service. Um, the state is also offering additional subsidy for the lead subsidy portion. So we're going to be working on that. We don't have final numbers on that, but if the town, um, whatever the town could become eligible for that, that's going to reduce the uh, loan amount of the $1,050,000 that we've estimated. Uh, projected impact on the current water rates. Uh, typical residential water customer pays $118.35 per quarter. Um, there's about 500 equivalent units in the town. Uh, we're projecting with the current funding package, uh, and we are, are counting, we are not counting the uh, lead subsidy portion as part of that because that's to be determined, but we're looking at an increase of about $13 and 12 cents per quarter per residential water customer. And the debt retirement, again, is on the $1,050,000. That's 0% in, in 40 years. Um, if the bond vote does not pass in November, uh, the town is still required to uh, complete the water system improvements. Um, 
they'd have to discuss, you know, whether to come back to another bond vote in March. But at this point, the compliance schedule, all the work is, is scheduled to be completed if the bond vote passes by the end of 2020. Uh, the other thing is if it didn't pass, the town probably wouldn't qualify for this additional subsidy, um, the 25% on the first come, first serve basis. So the funding package right now is very, very favorable. Uh, during the construction process, uh, we would expect there's going to be interruptions, uh, brief and water service. You know, they're going to be working in certain segments depending, you know, the day and as we go through the summer. We expect the construction work to occur the majority of next season. So they'll start April and May out there and probably go right through November. You know, where they're reconnecting, you know, putting new valves, new sections of water line testing. Uh, there will be brief shutdowns to, you know, uh, local residents and businesses. That will be all communicated ahead of time so that everybody can plan accordingly. Um, and then when they're reconnecting the service, there may be a short, that short, um, short, brief shutdown. And again, that would all be uh, coordinated with a property owner ahead of time. And, and the attempt is to minimize that to the extent possible. Uh, we're scheduled if the bobble passes the design, we're approaching 90% complete. So we'll be working on the permits over the next couple of months. Uh, getting the construction loan application in, getting all that in place. Uh, we're looking to be out for bid here in February timeframe of 2020 so the town can get um, good, you know, competitive pricing on the construction work. Uh, so the contractor would start in the spring and the work would go through the entire, um, right through the end of uh, 2000, 2020. So, okay. Um, I'm just going to have Tim Raymond uh, very briefly. We'll talk a little bit. He's from the Drinking Water Groundwater Protection Division. And uh, so he's the guy from the state here. So that's requiring us to. Well, right? Wayne, Wayne, <laughs> Wayne, the engineer, just stole a lot of my thunder. So you're going to hear a lot of the same things again, but hopefully I'll say it in a different way. Um, Tim Raymond, again, I'm with the State of Vermont Drinking Water Division. Uh, my function with the Drinking Water Division is I oversee the technical, financial, and, man uh, and managerial viability of community drinking water systems. Um, I've been in the state of Vermont with the Drinking Water Program for 32 years. I uh, first became aware of Bethel immediately following uh, Hurricane Irene, August 28, 2011. And I firsthand became aware of some of the difficulties that not just Bethel, but many water systems have when they're challenged by storm events at that time. Um, we've been working with the local town officials since that time on trying to increase the technical, financial, and managerial viability of the community water system. One of the things that we recently engaged the town on was something called the Asset Management Program. Um, uh, Asset management is really just a way of recognizing uh, what your assets are and when you need to plan to replace things before they fail. Unfortunately for the town of Bethel, the water distribution system is aged and uh, it's, it's really outlived its usefulness. There's uh, uh, quantity and quality issues of concerns. It means there's insufficient flow and pressure uh, to really serve the users of the system, especially under a fire flow event, if the community were to have a fire in the downtown. So we requested, um, through a number of sanitary survey inspections, but in this, this last uh, April, we conducted a sanitary survey inspection. It resulted in a list of recommendations. The community was working with their consulting engineer to address those recommendations, and uh, we developed a what we call a schedule of compliance through the water system's operating permit. The operating permit does require that, that uh, the water distribution system uh, be addressed and that the uh, controls for the tanks be addressed along with some minor improvements for the storage tanks. Um, it does stipulate a compliance deadline by de December of 2020. Uh, if anybody has any questions, wants to talk more about those types of things, I'm sure this is absolutely the place that we're going to do it. Thank you. Just one thing I want to make sure. the size. And this is a question that comes up. Sorry. So to be very clear on the uh, bond vote next week, the entire town votes. 
Uh, the debt retirement on the water system improvements is, is paid back by the water system customers. So even if you live in the town, unless you're connected to the water system, you are going to be paying for the water system improvements. So, okay. So was it your company that did the estimating? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So the town doesn't have um, who the construction people are yet, right? No, no we'll, yeah. they'll go out to bid in the spring with um, the contractors and that has to be publicly bid. Yep. Okay. So I have a couple of things. Um, first, so if, if the water users, the water subscribers, I don't, I'm a little unclear how it is that, that they can foot the bill for this whole thing when it's the town, all the town residents that are deciding whether or not it happens. Uh, in, my, in my head, I'm, I'm kind of thinking like a good example is um, school taxes. Like I don't have any kids, but I still pay school taxes. Why is it that the people that aren't hooked to the water system but are still members of this community aren't being asked to pay their way? Well, I, um, Tim or anybody else can jump in at any time, but. You know, my point of view on that is when we when we first started this process, um, you know, I, I'd say almost a year ago, when we were kicking around, you know, these big numbers of upgrading the system, and you know, we're really looking at like that two point eight three million dollar cost to the town going. How are we going to make this work? I mean, obviously, you know, if if we had to fund two point eight million dollars just straight out, that we would need input for. We need um, responsibilities from both identities to pay for it. So there would be the end water user as well as the taxpayers. So I mean, instantly I was kind of thinking like, you know, if we could get to a 50-50, that would be like a win. You know, 50% on the on the tax um, population and 50% on the water users. But as we came through the process and were able to um, look into some of the revenues that are available for the project. Quickly, it became, you know, that 2.8, $3 million, you know, has made its way down to a million dollars and it couldn't even go lower than that. Um, so at that point, uh, we were able to look at the, the water customers themselves on taking this responsibility. Um, because uh, right now, I mean, even though we have had um, increases in the last three years in the water system, which, you know, I would say are significant, um, based upon the history of the water in the town. We still pay in this town on average less than the majority of others in the state of Vermont. So even though us locally we're saying, wow, I, you know, we were paying less than $80 a while ago and now we're paying $118. It's, it's a drastic increase to us, but if you look at, if you look at the averages um, throughout the state of Vermont, you know, they range from anywhere from $60 to 180 to $200 a quarter. So we're still, even with putting this um, package together and having the water system units who's pay for it themselves, we're still well inside the, the range, I guess you'd say, of, of, wall, uh, of uh, water responsibility uh, for the users. So, um, so at that point, it's an easier sell to the, it's an easier sell to the public by having the water users take it on than it is to ask for everybody to take it on. Uh, guarantee it if, if let's say we were in this situation and the state saying you guys have until the end of the next year to get this done and we're sitting here with a 2.8 million dollar amount with nothing you know no no subsidies um, you know another thing that we don't talk about on this is you know we have about 1.8 million dollars coming off the top here to start and it could get better than that but we're also not paying interest, you know, so we're, there's a savings there. And you, you know, you start thinking one, two, three percent on $2.8 million, it's a lot of money. So there's that savings as well. Um, but right now we just, we feel right now that the, the, the increase would be a very modest increase um, for the customers to be able to absorb. Um, we hope that by having the new system entail that they'll create efficiencies for that water system um, that, you know, in the next period of time, once we get the new operating system in, that there'll be some efficiencies that the water users will be able to take advantage of as well. Um, so, 
feel free to yeah. help out if anybody else. But. You know, part of it too is obviously because we are looking at such a, a great package from the state, part of it is obviously, you know, we're going to get a lot of pushback from residents that are not on the water system. I've already fielded several phone calls, you know, where people were confused about how the bond we paid back and it's, well, if my well pump dies, you're not coming up here, you know, that type of thinking. So um, certainly because we felt that the water system could manage the cost, that that was, you know, obviously one of the bigger reasons because we are in a time crunch, not only to, uh, to get the things corrected from the sanitary survey, but to take advantage of this money that's available, we, you know, we have to pass that bond vote, so. And any time you have to ask for money from multiple identities, it becomes a, a harder sell, um, you know, so it was after looking at the, well, we first started looking at the figures um, six months ago, maybe. <clears throat> about six months ago, I was actually surprised that, I mean, I'm a water user, I'm on the water line, last one on Pleasant Street, um, and, you know, I was actually very surprised because I thought, you know, off the top that my water rates are probably going to go up 25, 30 bucks a quarter, and we're going to have to get the non-water users to ask for a piece of this, you know, and then to have it come in and we're looking at less than 14 bucks, and it could possibly go down from there, depending on how much galvanized we get a one-for-one -one trade on. Um, it's, you know, it's a good deal all around. Um, um, so I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about, um, as I said in the last time I was at one of these meetings, I'm really worried about the length of time that this project is going to take. So can you talk about if there have been any, I guess you'd call them incentives that are built into this for the construction company to complete this project in a timely manner? Well, there's incentive, there's well, adverse incentives if they don't. There's That's going to be things built into the contract that they need to get, you know, from point A to point B done at a certain time. Um, and a side note, I want to let you know, I, the um, Vermont um, Community Development met here today and I spoke to Richard I know, more, and, and he actually gave me a con is going to email me with a contact at USDA RD. Apparently, there's two times a year about getting money for downtown, and it's not capital, but it's money for advertising and things like that. So I should have some information on that tomorrow. But as far as Wayne, what's your experience with? Um, do you expect this project to go from just you know May 1st to October 31st, or do you have some? So you obviously have more of a historical knowledge yeah. than I do. So that's so yeah. The, the whole project really, its entire is going to be under construction for that duration. Now, keep in mind, there's work in a lot of different locations here. You know, that's not to say that you know there's work. You know, the contractors working over here to run power up to the storage main. You know, when they're working on Main Street, you know, they're going to be working in you know kind of short chunks every day. So there'll be some temporary disruption in the business where they are, but they're not going to be on Main Street the whole you know whole summer. Um, you know, they'll be kind of working their way and impact the businesses individually as they go. Um, they probably won't have more than one crew, so, you know, they'll be digging the water line. You know, once they get that backfill, then there'll be some other work that's going to come through with kind of a roadway surface restoration. But we're definitely, they have to, they're going to have to maintain a minimum one-way traffic through here, too. That's going to be a must because we can't, you know, limit that. Or, um, and, and then the other thing is that we have a... Um, State requires we have a resident engineer on site, which is really the contractor, you know, so he's working between the contractor and the town's agent, you know, so one of the things that's really important with that is he can be a real advocate for, you know, businesses and all that stuff, just to make sure that, you know, next week, and typically what happens is they're meeting on site on a weekly basis, um, so the contractor is saying, you know, okay, next week I'm going to be here, so try to communicate with different property owners and business owners as, as, to the extent possible. <clears throat> there will be some disruptions. Um, you know, they're digging right down the middle of the downtown Main Street area, but, you know, just trying to make sure there's good communication all the way around and try to um, alleviate that, minimize that to the extent we can. So. And, and also, just to piggyback on that, you know, typical projects like this, because I've been involved in many of them, is, you know, once the project gets going, um, you know, the contractor is going to continue to put out their, you know, one, two, and three week look aheads of, of building the project for the public. And that usually goes through the resident engineer as well as the resident engineer will probably be working with Therese on saying, you know, can we put this, can we put this out to 
um, to the public, letting them know that, you know, next week they're going to be working in this area. So, you know, it may or may not impact your business for that week, but others can plan around, okay, it's going to be in front of the sandwich shop. So, you know, how, how are we going to move deliveries in and out, you know, that kind of thing. So it allows some, some of that conversation um, to take place. Um, can they do any nighttime work? It's not been a possibility or not? Probably yeah. not. They, they, they can, you know, we will require that occasion. Um, mm -hmm. The challenge there, you know, the state is obviously doing a lot more of that. And the primary objective there is just to minimize the disruption. Mm -hmm. really drives the cost up, you know, that's a tough thing. And, you know, I don't know, pipe work is hard. Sometimes on occasion they'll have to do that if they're making a connection. And, that you prefer to do that off hours at night or maybe on the weekend. Um, but, you know, from a safety standpoint, you guys work in a ditch, a backhoe, and all that kind of stuff. And then you think about the um, just people that are living along the street, you know, the noise and all that stuff in the off hours. So I think it's something that people are looking at a lot more. But, you know, there's some pros and cons in that, like, you know, when there is everything else. I know one other thing that we had. Um, that we had identified at the last meeting and the meeting before that, which was the select board meeting, was talking about that there will be some uh, there'll be some routes that people will be trying to fly route around town. Um, you know, going up Sand Hill and down around the Boulevard would probably be one of them. Um, and making sure that we have have something put into the bid package to talk about maintenance in those roads that may see a higher volume of traffic during those peaks because obviously probably a lot of us that live around here will find other ways to move around town and you know usually the delivery trucks and the devastators will, won't they'll have to come through main street still but you know getting um, taking care of some of the maintenance costs for sand hill and peavine boulevard and those so that we can make sure that's maintained that way the town doesn't have to to do it I mean, it's it clearly it's going to be an inconvenience. It, you know, it, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that you're not going to be inconvenienced because you are. Um, everybody that everybody between you know the feed place and Bethel Mills here is going to be inconvenienced at some point, if not periodically throughout the the summer. But we also have to kind of take this into perspective that you know this is a water system that once it's put in there. It should last us, we were talking last time, around 80 years. So this is a once in a lifetime event that's gonna happen to your resident or your business in this area. And you know, as long as we can come together and get through this, it's not an event that we're gonna have to see again. Um, the events that we do see quite a bit right now is Tim out there digging a hole in the street and then telling cockadoodles that they can't run water for the next three days. You know, those are the events that we're used to seeing in town um, that maybe don't cause a major disturbance to a business, but it's off, it's a small disturbance frequently, you know, um, that we're seeing a lot of. Um, so, and, and this will also take care of the, um, the curb stop, water shut off issues that we have in this town as well with either if there was a break, half the time we can't find the curb stops, uh, the records in the town, we can't find them, or they've been paved over, or they're not there, or they've been abandoned, or, or if a, you know, something happened, we had to shut water off to the building, if it wasn't a break, we don't know where they are, or a lot of times when you have to shut one off now, it affects other businesses. You know, if you had to shut one off for this business, it might affect the other two businesses. So um, that'll hopefully address that issue as well. The other thing, too, is there's a couple of good things that are coming up. I mean, I've, we've been approached, and I think I'd mentioned this, a business that was actually said, this is great, I need to do some maintenance inside, so I'll shut down for a few days. Somebody else has needed fire protection, so that's going to make his life a little easier. So there have been some other positive things that will come out of it. But um, again, you know, we're still, you know, I'm not talking to businesses and trying to think of ways that we can help the town, you know, advertise. And just like you said, you know, letting people know that Bethel's open for business. So, um, um, does, did, does this in the future um, relate to any of the other ones? Uh, will North Road or any of the other areas of town need, need um, major 
water lines fixed and stuff like that? And some of them. I mean, I know that there's gram and... Yeah, this isn't going to be the cure-all for everything, but no. what the remaining projects will all be manageable out of our annual budgets. And they'll oh. be planning moving forward to address that. Oh, okay. Yep. Yes? That was my question. The same one? <laughs> yeah. So we, and we have fielded a lot of questions in the last, especially the last week on other parts of the water system that aren't being done in this current plan and what, and what the stages are for those. And, and Tim feels at this point, well, one, this is kind of the larger project because it needs to get done during this period of time. And we felt if we added anything else to that, we wouldn't be able to get it done inside the time frame that we need to get it done, um, as well as the cost. It's that much more extra cost on, on the end users at this I, point, I know. where we feel if we stick to our annual budget with some of the other other jobs that we can do on an annual basis that we'll be able to include that in our normal uh, annual budget and, and, and hopes that they won't have to increase your water usage rates for those other future smaller projects. Why I ask that is because we had a bowl of water um, recently in, in North Road, Royalton Hill, up in that area, so I didn't know if those those lines. It was just a, sometimes what has happened, that was a perfect example of us needing to make a repair further down, but because there were no other shutoffs, you're t shutting down a majority of the system when it really was unnecessary if all the proper gate valves were installed. So that's one thing that this will rectify too, is help, <laughs> help cut down on that. Oh, okay, thank you. Wayne, I had a question I forgot, maybe you've answered and I forgot to ask you again, was I, just because we're rolling into budget season and I couldn't remember if there was like a warranty period and how the first loan payment, and I'm just trying to remember how that rolls yeah. out. It's been a while. Yeah, so that's a, there's a recent change on that. So basically, uh, so let's assume they're complete construction, you know, everything late next fall, there's a 12 month warranty period. I thought so. So that's going to extend into the end of 2021. That's on everything, you know, the paving, surface, um, all the buried work. Um, and then basically that first loan payment will start about that point three, so it's one year after the so substantial that, completion. Okay, that's what I wondered. I remembered that it with USDA be, funding there was, but I didn't think there was uh, a state and I couldn't it remember. It used to be two years for yeah. substantial completion, but uh, they just changed that within the last year or two, so it's one year. Okay, perfect. So the warranty period, that first loan payment will be due, you know, uh, about the same time, you know, the end, towards the end of 2021. Okay, perfect. I just was... Starting to work on budgets the other day, and I was like, "Oh, I forgot to ask Wayne this very important question." <laughs> Sorry, perfect, great. And, and one thing we've talked about at the other meetings, nobody's put a question on it now, but you know, a lot of the infrastructure that we have in this town is is aging, and we have not done the proper uh, maintenance thing schedule of these utilities. Um, so we're faced now to have to do larger larger fixes right now than smaller, you know, gradual scheduled fixes. Um, and, and really, you know, the, the town should be here having to figure out a way to come up with $2.8 million, really. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, we've, we're pretty lucky in the way that, you know, we, the town had been trying to address some of the water uh, issues here over the last couple of years. Plus, when the water survey went through, um, we. We've had this forward motion in town about getting through this project um, to the point right now we're ready to go, you know, almost ready to go to, to, to bid. And now we've, now there's some really good uh, grant and revenue uh, streams that have come through the state of Vermont and others. So, uh, you know, we, we are in a very good position to get a majority of this paid for, uh, which I think any of us sitting here Two years ago, we've been saying, you know, well, this is a big bill, and you know, we're going to have to eat 2.8 million dollars over 40 years, and and now we're thinking that you know, it may be a third of that. Um, so that it's very important right now, like they were saying, that you know, a positive bond vote means that we're going to be able to uh, maximize the revenue that's available to us. A negative bond vote means we still have to go forward with a project. We just may have to come up with some more money ourselves. And when that happens, we may have to look into other funding, um, which means we might have to open it up to 
you know, the non-water users to um, have to chip in if we lose substan substantial pieces of this revenue um, that's coming in. So, um, because right now, if we have a negative bond vote, we probably wouldn't be able to do anything again until like March or so. And by that time, you lose that on two critical things. You lose that on the 25% uh, revenue piece that's there right now on a first come first per basis, which isn't guaranteed, but we, you know, we're one of select uh, municipalities that have almost a project, you know, shelf project ready project to go. Um, so you have the potential of losing that, but um, but you also have um, the ability of um, I lost my train of thought now. But yeah, the lead subsidy. Um, well, the, the lead subsidies piece, which has just come come about, which we can take advantage of that we're going to have to do at some point. And now we can just kind of include it into this um, contract of bids later in the season. And and if we bid, there's a big difference between bid in February when contractors are hungry for work than it is to, you know, if we if we do a bond vote in March, which means we don't go to bid until like June, July, and then they're saying, and then what would happen at that point, if we did go to bid, is you would have a two year construction season. So you would have impact to the downtown in the late summer and fall, and then the next year to do the project. Plus, the chances are contractors, it's no, no different than anything else. Contractors get full, the prices go up, you know, they raise, and then the price of the project becomes greater. So, um, you've talked about water meters in the past. Um, this doesn't include putting no. in water meters, right? No, nope, this doesn't include any water meters at all. Oh. Yes. Are you getting a sense that there's any opposition in the town? Um, I, I would, you know, we've been actively fielding all kinds of different feedback. Um, I would say overall, um, the feedback has been positive. Um, I, ha you know, I've, I personally, and guys can chip, and you know, I, I fielded a few uh, pieces on, on, you know, why we chose to go with the water users as a, as being responsible for payment on the, the end note. Um, we fielded a lot of questions in regards to, you know, what happens to the pieces of the water system that currently isn't on the table for plans, um, which we've been talking about, you know, doing that through our annual budgets. Um, and then, you know, and then we do field a few of the calls of, you know, I live in a certain area where the water system doesn't impact me, why, why should I come out and vote? Um, which has been clearly, what we've been telling people is, you know, you, it may not impact you now, but if it's not a positive bond vote, it could come back to impact you um, at this point. So um, it's, it's very important that everybody comes out to vote. Um, so I, I mean, right now, um, my feeling is that, that there won't be a lot of people coming out to vote on it, um, but overall it seems positive. Just a line across that, so keep balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have had, we've been lucky. Yep. We've had some snowbirds, yep. and they've all come in to vote. You yep. know, before that, before um, <clears throat> they're going to Florida or going wherever else they're going. So warmer climate. Yeah, we so. have fielded a lot of questions and yep. absentee ballots. Absolutely, yep. and they are available. So. Yep, yep. We made them right after, you know, right after we um, lawyer had looked at the bond stuff. So no, I feel like you know anything we've heard overall is positive. People aren't. Excited about having the downtown torn up, but they know what the necessity is. So. Couldn't be any worse than the project they just had. <laughs> oh yeah, <Okay>. right. <laughs> uh, which was a state project. We say yeah. that clearly. That was not the town of Bethel. It was the state of Vermont. Yeah. So, but yeah, I exactly. <laughs> yes, but we if, fielded a lot of complaints about that. But if so. we look at the town of Bethel, and we look back over the last like ten years in Bethel. A majority of our infrastructure has been improved in the last 10 years. I mean, we, you know, you start basically at the Church Street Bridge here um, that was done, I think, just about 10 years ago. You know, that kind of kicked off the movement in this town. And, and the way the state likes to do their cycles, they, they kind of come in and they hit an area, and then 15 years later, they come back to you. And, you know, the Church Street Bridge was done 10 years ago. Uh, the River Street Bridge was just done. 107 was done. Route 12 through through, you know, the downtown was done, 12 going to Randolph has been done, and now, you know, the 107 up to the interstate. So, 
Where yeah, we are. Work is done. And, well, yeah. and the bridge, the bridge out on uh, uh, North um, 12 is being done. So, I mean, if you really look at it, we're pretty fortunate. A majority of our infrastructure is new. Um, and, and, and new is exciting, especially if you're in a, a business where you um, require tourists to come in and visit your shops because people don't want to drive through a bumpy road or over old crickety bridge. And now if we could just get that ugly wall fixed, we'd be all set. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we, you know, and then, you know, to piggyback on that with some of the successes of the village with, um, you know, different grants and, and things that, um, um, that we've been able to take advantage of and Bethel's on the map. And, and I would say there's a lot of reasons why we get grant money right now is because there's a lot of vibe about the Bethel. Any other questions? <clears throat> Is there anything, Tim, that you want to interject? No, I think everybody pretty much had it. Um, I don't think that it's going to impact everybody as hard as they think. It's not going to be a lot bigger than one of the projects we do now, right, really, when we're doing a repair, except they're going to be reaching out for probably 20, 30 feet or whatever the length is going to be. It's not so much. No, I know. We, you and I have talked about it. It's about whether really Bethel's open for business. It's, it's the perception of being cornered and stockers and Rochester. That, and I have some ideas. About oh, great. That. Excellent. Um, but, yeah, I'm not at all worried about the ditch in front of my Yeah. I'm worried about the little old lady in Barnard who thinks that the traffic goes all the way to the high school every single day. And she's exactly. Yeah, upgrading the power this year really gave a bad impression. They had some pretty bad traffic packages. And, and anything from the local businesses, if, if you have any suggestions or ideas, I mean, feel free to. Yeah, please you know, this, let me know. This is the opportunity this period right now where we haven't gone to bid, so there's still some chances to put in some things in the bid about, you know, completion dates or sensitive times, you know, like board festival, you know, those types of things that we can put in the contract not to work during this time or. Eight to five. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try it. If only, only that's possible. <laughs> you got that? Eight to five? Well, they won't be, they won't be working <laughs> eight at night till five in the morning. They won't be working. <laughs> no. so. But there is some opportunity, in, you know, and Therese has been, you know, reaching out there to see if there are any type of revenue sources um, to help the downtown businesses and, you know, through either advertising or. I know, I, I've talked with a lot of my peers, and, and just for your authentication, mm -hmm. there's not, not, I don't think any of us are worried about, um, like in my case, I'll just speak for myself, I have plenty of credit with all my suppliers, so right. I'm not all worried about that. Um, and I think it's pretty much the same way with my peers, so we're not, no, none of us are expecting you know, right, you're just out, I mean, right. We're just looking for yeah. money for advertising and right. to kind of keep exactly. those ideas exactly. and some fresh ideas. Yeah. And I will say, by talking to you know residents, I've talked to the sandwich shop, and I still need to go to talk to Cockadoodle and um, Babes. And but people, you know, some of the businesses themselves have had some great ideas about changing it up a little bit in their own business to accommodate this and maybe won't be open for breakfast, but you'll be open for dinner or, or this or that. So. I mean, definitely and, some people are doing some <clears throat> box thinking, which is great. But any ideas you have would be welcome. And we're certainly, um, the town, obviously, and I've said this before, and we're going to say it again, is we're certainly planning to do some advertisement ourselves, you know, on behalf to just let people know, you know, that Bethel is open for business. And maybe there's a way, too, we can reach out to, there certainly is a way we can reach out to Rochester, Barnard, and to, to you know, different clerk's offices and stuff. And, and um do that as well, you know, from Porch Forum, that sort of thing, too. And we'll work with the engineer and the contractor in regards to making sure that, you know, that things are open for business in the off hours, like, you know, parking, um, pedestrian accessibility, things like that that comes with construction. Um, you know, we'll lose parking spots during the daytime, but maybe we can regain them in the nighttime. So just a show of hands of who came here tonight just to hear about the water bond information. 
All right. Oh, okay. All right. So we're tied from last time. So we're six and six. <laughs> Thank you for coming this evening. Yeah. If you have any other further questions, feel free to reach out to Therese or Tim. Yep. Um, Please. You know, Please. 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 I still have one you gave me before that I have that up.
testament on insulating the drug basement and look at those stairs. Let me know what's in the building. Okay. And know what's in the attic in that building. It's scary. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so Okay. Yeah, just let me come back. Come back, please. I'd love to um, have you go through and give me some advice. Yeah. Yeah. It's not quite 7 o'clock, but um, Rebecca, you want you, yeah. you guys all set to go We're all 10 set. minutes earlier? Definitely. Okay, now we don't have to sit around? Yeah. You would. Oh, I was. <laughs> so, hi okay, everyone. Um, I know all of you. I'm Rebecca. I'm Rebecca. I'm Rebecca. This is Josh Rowe. Uh, so we're here to talk to you all quickly about the Working Communities Challenge, which is a new grant program open in the state of Vermont right now. So this is actually a grant put out by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, if you're like me, you had no idea they did that sort of thing for communities. <laughs> but they have been doing a lot of work out of their community development arm to boost economic development, community revitalization, and especially programs that really benefit low and moderate income people. And they've started these programs, which were first called the Working with Cities Challenges in Massachusetts. They expanded to Rhode Island and Connecticut, did some prior programs there. And this year, they've been partnering with Vermont, so this is really their first test to try this type of grant in a rural northern New England state. It's a pretty exciting opportunity. So the way the program works is they are asking communities to pair up or work together statewide. If you're a large enough community with more than 6,000 population, you could go it alone. Any smaller than that, you have to be part of a team. They do a first round, so they're asking communities to come together as a team or collaborative and apply for a planning grant. That grant would be up to $15,000, and that would be available in the spring to really come together as a group of communities or teams to talk about what a really great project would look like to improve collaboration around economic revitalization and helping people. They will then pick um, three out of the six who receive planning grants to get up to $300,000 over three years for implementation. So there's no actual match requirement on this one. This is not one where we have to fork over $100,000 for ourselves. Um, pretty exciting opportunity. And they're really looking for big picture, innovative, cutting edge ideas. They're looking at communities, putting their heads together to figure out how to creatively make a dent in these really big systemic community issues. So um, many of you know I've actually been bored. Um, I'm always interested in looking for opportunities like this. You've all been really supportive of trying creative, interesting things in Bethel and bringing in some outside funding. And this is a fascinating opportunity to work with other communities. So they actually identified a set of priority communities in the state. One of those priority communities must be on the application. Bethel is not one of them, <laughs> but Randolph and Royalton are. So it's been really fun to talk with Josh about what a collaborative White River Valley effort could look like. I'll pass it to you. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you're thinking and where this is coming from, Randolph? Yeah, when I first fell out of this program back in July, they had a soft rollout, uh, knowing that minimum population need to be 6,000, Randolph is a minimum population of 6,000. So a regional uh, approach is what I designed. Um, you know, with the communities around Randolph. Um, and, and so a, a regional approach is what I think we're working towards. Uh, Chelsea, Rochester, uh, Randolph, Braintree, Brookfield, um, Bethel, um, even some other communities out there. I have a feeling that Royalton, Tunbridge um, will also join us. And it's, it, I've heard Hancock, Granville, um, Stockbridge also. Uh, but this is an opportunity uh, to affect change. They're so really looking for systems change. How do we provide more economic opportunities for low and moderate income individuals? Uh, what are the changes that we need to make, whether that's childcare, affordable housing, uh, skills development, 
uh, skilling up the workforce. Um, so many employers in this area cannot fill all of the positions that are available uh, because of a, a number of things, but a lot of them uh, it tends to be individuals not having the proper skills. Uh, and so, you know, this is a planning grant, like Rebecca said. Uh, six months next year, the, those six communities or six applicants um, getting the, the funding will have about six months to develop their plan, work together. Uh, there'll be a core team of uh, about eight to 12 people. Uh, and the, the whole collaboration can, be, can involve much more people than that, but the core team uh, will be about eight to 12. Um, and that's, that's not my decision, that's the Fed's decision. Uh, during that planning process, uh, the Fed will convene those core teams and provide technical assistance. So the Fed will bring in their uh, expertise and help these individuals and communities develop their plans for implementation. After that process, um, two to three communities or applicants teams will be selected to receive those implementation funds. Um, and then those funds will, will probably start in September of next year. And they're three-year commitments, $100,000 a year. Um, and you know, in, in their experiences in Southern New England, those communities that were selected, those funds were utilized to hire uh, human capital talent to help those communities uh, see those plans that they had developed to fruition. Um, all of the communities around here, we don't, we're just so understaffed, we don't have enough capacity to work on all of the projects that all of our communities need to be working on. And it's so critical right now. Um, and so this is a great opportunity for Vermont, for rural uh, New England, to see how it can impact uh, our community. So I, I'm, I'm hopefully Bethel would like to uh, participate in this collaboration. Uh, the Fed has said that getting select board buy-in is very important um, to do such a thing. Um, you mentioned to me a letter of intent, and I guess my question is, I mean, I think it's a great idea, and certainly um, uh, have seen in, in our hiring, um, you know, Chris uh, works for a large company, and, and I think that for, you know, I'm certainly interested, you know, personally and for the town, because we're having a hard time hiring, because we're scaling up workers and, and kind of in a unique opportunity because um, obviously we have a, a school here, but uh, Randolph has, you know, a great technical center and then you have VTC. So um, does the select board, if obviously if they agree to do a letter of intent, do you, how does the select board get a say in what they want to see happen? Is that something done in the letter of intent? Is that just in who they pick to participate? And then obviously I'm sure it's kind of a democracy. Once you get rolling, you get what you get. But I think that for, um, you know, and obviously you're, you have a struggle because unemployment rate is so low. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm just curious how the select board gets there. Yeah, well, I think, I think it, um it, it involves like individuals in each community. You're going to have those those really dire supporters. Of course, yeah. Uh, and so, because I mean, this is a regional approach. We're we're looking at possibly a 10, 12 town sort of consortium. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I mean, we can't have every select board member from every town at the table. No, just no, 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 no. Not I agree. Agree. No, no, I just meant in general, is it something you want to see in their letter of intent, or do you just want it to be vague, and then we discuss this with, you know, as the process goes, or how, is, how do we get input, I guess, is my question. Yeah, well, I've, I've drafted a letter of intent. Uh, it is uh, 50 words, maximum, mm -hmm. so right. it's, it's very small. Yeah. Um, it was, I kept it pretty broad. I, I put Bethel on there in mm -hmm. more target towns. Um, so that's due November 1st. I intend to submit that, you know, either today or uh, tomorrow or Thursday or Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, as I imagine it, um, you know, working with our other partners like Gifford, BTC, right. um, the Tech Center, uh, Community, uh, Capstone Community Action, nice. Clint Martin, yeah. all the partners that we feel have, uh, that are stakeholders in this type of work, I would like there to be, I would like them to be at the table. And much like the work that we did in Randolph over the Randolph Region Re Energize mm -hmm. um, initiative from uh, Vermont Council and Rural Development, where we had task forces. Yeah. And then those chairs on the task forces then 
or like that core team. I imagine that much of that would be structured in the same way. Excellent. Well, that's great to know. I was trying to, I was thinking about it after you called and then <clears throat> I talked to Rebecca and I had given the select board the working cities kind of the overview of it and put it in their packet and then chatted. I was just curious about how it would all roll out. But, you know, obviously, I mean, I think it's a. But you'd be looking at multiple areas. You talked about child care, housing, and not just training skilled workers. It could per be se. focusing. So I was actually just looking at some of the projects they funded in other states today. I scrolled up through them, and some of them were quite narrow. Some focused on one neighborhood, and we're really focusing on the employment gap between that neighborhood and the rest of the city. Um, some are much broader, focusing on general access to resources and information and opportunity, or looking at a combination of three factors that are really important. There was one I believe that looked at housing, child care, and food access together. Well, I know I hear about child care, you know, yeah. in our area here. So I think in terms of timing, you know, the letter of intent doesn't require any specificity. Right. Oh, okay. Josh has a meeting scheduled for the 20th. Do I have that right? Uh, letter of intent due November 1st, and then the actual grant application is due December 13th. So What's the first meeting you scheduled though? Oh, for, for next November uh, 6th. Okay, so first up is trying to get together representatives of all these communities for a first conversation. Mm -hmm. um, to say, you know, what's going on in each town, where do they need to be each city, what could be yeah. the focus area. I did speak today with Gary Holloway, Department of Housing and Community Development, and asked, you know, this is a short amount of time to try to get a group of towns on board with one focus area. Could we really focus on that in the planning grant phase? And he said, well, you really need to have some sort of focus, at least. So I think they will be open to really robust planning processes. And I think we can do a good job on that and make that much more of a collaborative effort to really shape a project. But we'll have to have some sort of focus by December. Mm. Yeah. So Lindley, was that something, I'm trying to remember the emails between um, Rebecca and, and yourself and and, um, and Josh, is that something that you would, would you be able to attend? I can't do that meeting, but. The November 6th one, yeah, it yeah. may yeah. be at the Arnold Block. Yeah. yeah. To be yes. accepted, but <laughs> um, yeah, so that I am planning to attend that meeting and sort of, yeah, get a feel for what's going on. And, and is that something you'll stay in that process? Most likely, I mean, maybe not as one of the, you know, top people yeah. in the core group, but that I will certainly stay up with what's going on. Um, yeah. And I, w I would imagine that someone within the sphere of either the Arnold Block or BRI, you know, we're, we're sort of all interconnected in that way of constantly communicating with one another about initiatives. So I, I have a feeling that, yes, I would yeah. stay involved with Is that it. something that you're interested in doing and <clears throat> being that? I'm happy to be. So uh, I have to say, we did discuss it at BRI. BRI is excited about the idea and glad to support it when that turns out to be. I also mentioned it to the principals of the school, and they're interested in the idea and want to explore being involved as well. Um, so especially for these first planning meetings, Josh is hoping having like, two people from each town. I would be glad to be one of them, Ethel, and would be excited about it, but okay. the board people are going to point something else. I'm happy to also be. Yeah, even the feds, uh, the language, if you read through all the materials, even they understand, you know, they're looking for applicants that have 6,000 population. Well, there's so many Vermont communities oh, right. that have less than that. Oh, absolutely. And, and so even even with the six towns and this consortium, um, that population is only about 11,500. So, and they're used to implementing this type of program in southern New England where their minimum population is 35,000. Right. So it's, it's, the scale is so much different. So they understand how do you get <laughs> regions to, to meet those minimum population requirements. It takes a lot of towns, a lot of people. And so that planning phase is going to take a little bit longer because there are instances where you're, you're going to be working with a town or working with groups that have never, ever communicated or talked right. to them. So sure. uh, there's some flexibility. They understand even by the application date in December, Plans are going to have a framework, but not not everything's going to be worked out. And so, mm -hmm. like that for the six months next year is really going to shake it all up. Yeah. I certainly think it was a great mm -hmm. idea, and, and I think it was um, maybe Rebecca who emailed first, and then Josh called, and and then we were able to get the information. I read through it, and and I think any opportunity for economic development and, and bringing somebody in is a, is a great idea. So. Yeah.
And I, you know, we, you know, the board, you know, Mo and I are the last two from the original board, but, you know, we've always been behind, you know, trying new things and anything with a grant, you know, with any type of possibilities is always a good thing. I guess, you know, just kind of looking through this, I guess some of the concerns I would have is, you know, you know, you had some challenges here. I mean, it's not like you're a, you know, a suburb of a city or, or you know, a, a large town where you can kind of hone in onto one segment of your town. I mean, you're talking about six different identities that have, you know, n not only all their own challenges, right, and voices, but also, you know, geographic challenges. I mean, you know how the state of Vermont works, you get across the mountain range, you get to each town, and, yeah. you know, it, you know, just, you know, from going from, whatever, Randolph to Rochester, or from Rochester to Chelsea, or, you know, I mean, there's, there's those challenges there, so, you know, how do you come up with a project that all six identities can take part in, you know, and, it, you know, in some ways, I just kind of feel like there's probably the opportunity that some of these identities might lose out somehow, you know, it might be more focused on, at the end of the day, it might be more focused in one area and not so much the other one, you know what I mean? Because it's, you know, six identities. I don't I think know. Like, but I think to some of us all have the same challenges. We yeah, all have true. a challenge for child care. We all have a child, same challenge for skilling up, you know, right. workforce and, and housing. And I know for a while, the Vermont was focusing not on low-income housing, but they were coining worker housing because that was a big thing in the prior town. We were trying to focus on that as well. Something wasn't low-income, but was still affordable. And, and there's always a need, you know, obviously for, for that. And so I think in some ways, but you're right. I mean, you have Branchery, Brookfield, and Bethel. I mean, yeah. they're, you know, they have... I mean, I would just be interested to see what project <clears throat> comes out of it yeah, and how, how all the communities can be involved in that project, especially when they... You know, in some cases, they're separated by, yeah. you know, 20 miles and mountains in between. And yeah. uh, how how that looks like, and I guess, and then Therese kind of already stole the other question I had was, you know, at that point is, you know, not that this, the board wants to weigh in on it, but yeah. you know, once you pick a project, obviously that project's going to impact the communities in one way or another. You know, likely for the good, but you know, so, you know how it is. Sometimes there are projects that are started that don't get finished, and how does that impact? Well, see our community here. You know, we, you know, at what point in the process do we get a say on, you know, yes, we want to go forward with this, or, or, or after we sign off on this, is it just a, you guys take it and go with it, um, take right. thing. So, right. and I, I look at this less as um, a, a development of, of a one project per se. You know, we have a lot of, yeah, there are a lot of communities involved that we're trying to get for this regional application. We all have very similar challenges. But um, three hundred thousand dollars is really a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. Hundred thousand dollars a year, you know, it's very minimal. So look at it as those resources can utilize, um, can get the human capital that we don't already have, right? So for instance, my conversations with VTC, uh, they don't have a grant writer on staff because they don't have enough funds to hire somebody. They only have enough for a half-time person. Well, in education institutions like that, you can't just hire a half-time grant writer. Like, they, they want full-time employment. So if some of the funds were utilized to help get a full-time grant writer, that person might be able to focus on all of the communities and their specific needs for grant writing purposes. So those are conversations that I've already had. It's a possibility, but look at it like that. It's not just like, we're gonna develop one project for one community, you know, that might be, um, Utilized by the whole region, but we all have individual needs, and, and maybe our, you know, this town over here is different from this town, but they they need similar help, so we can find the consultants that can help them, or uh, a way to like do childcare differently as a region, um, shared services. Maybe there's a way uh, that municipalities can talk about their plans going further that can help them save money in the long run. So, so, you know, stuff like that. So, it's, I know it's hard to look at it not as just like brick and mortar project, but um, that's how that's how I'm approaching it as. But I think you're right. I mean, human capital is a big thing. I mean, you know, municipalities are generally we do a lot with a little, and yeah. uh, so you're right. And, and uh, I totally understand what you're saying. It makes sense if you can bring somebody in that can 
you know, we can't afford to hire, you know, a full-time grant. We can't, you know, we just can't. I mean, you know, we're looking Randolph, so, I mean, like, they have you, so well, that's great. You're even, you know, you're ahead of, first of Bethel, so it's terrific. Um, but I like the idea of what you're saying that makes kind of, because I had some of the questions like Chris did, but now that you're putting it in the perspective of human capital, it makes it a little more understandable. Yeah. And, like, and achievable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I am the only, like, economic development professional in <laughs> all the communities. Yeah. Uh, and so this, you know, like, Randolph is a priority community, and so, like, I'm here, I'm, I, I want to, this to happen. It's, it's in my best interest for it to happen. Mm -hmm. And so helping other communities is part of that. Uh, and, and so, you know, like I see it as a regional, I don't see it as just like Randolph. Um, we're the second most rural part of the state. You know, we need to have some collaboration on a regional scale to get things done that we need. Mm -hmm. to have I think it's true, because if we're bringing people to Bethel, they're easily gonna go to Randolph or vice versa. So, I mean, I think it's, I think it's true. I think it's, that's a great point. I think that's a huge part of it, really. One of their major goals is opening the door to collaboration and communication. So they're actually basing this program off some pretty interesting studies. You might be interested to go to their website and check out some of the background research. But they're finding that what really makes a difference in alleviating poverty and boosting the local economy in some post-industrial cities is um, strong product leadership and building connections between people, building shared information channels, sharing solutions so that it's not one pocket over here planning in isolation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of thing that really could help this region. I've done some work with the Mad River Valley and I think they do that better than any other part of the state. Yeah. It really helps them. They save money town by town because they're collaborating and sharing resources. They're not all figuring out individually how to handle things. Um, you know, they do some things as simple as getting their road crews together for donuts a few times a year so that they can each talk about how they're handling the increased flood water. Mm -hmm. So um, any number of possibilities can come out, but to your other question, Chris, about when and how the board weighs in, I think there are probably several points. So if you're all in favor of joining the letter of interest, that involves no commitment, really. It just puts our name on it at this point. If Bevel decided to back out in the next month, we could we could come back before the application goes in in December and talk with the board about what the focus area is looking like at that point. If you want to provide it, but before then, we are going to have you know a couple of planning meetings. Lindley will be a representative, it sounds like. You can sort of pass and go to us about the challenges and concerns you think should be priorities from the board level. And then if we did join that application and were selected as one of the planning communities, we'd really have all spring to get pretty creative about how to have some great conversations in the region about what's needed and how to shape the project. So a lot of opportunities there. I personally think it's a great idea. I mean, we're better together than we are separately. So. <laughs> no, I think it's good step in the right direction. Um, certainly in the planning stage at this point, but I think it, uh, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain <laughs> by supporting the, uh, supporting the group, at least at this phase. It'd be interesting to see, you know, down the road, uh, when, after you come back with some more ideas about the actual planning part of it. Yeah. Have you gone to the other communities, any of the other communities, and looks any kind of feedback from them? Uh, uh, they're interested. Braintree, Brookfield, they're very interested. Um, Brookfield has been participating in some of our R3 task force meetings, so they, they've been aware of this program for at least six weeks. Um, and Rochester is also interested. Uh, tomorrow night, I'll be uh, at the Chelsea Slepper meeting, talking with them about it. Uh, they have shown interest so far, so it's the same thing as with tonight. I'll be doing that in Chelsea. Uh, of course, Randolph has voted to, to, to partner with these communities also. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really interesting. Uh, and it's an opportunity to think outside the box and do some really creative regional collaboration. So is that what you're looking for, the select board to, to vote so that there's something in their minutes that says that you have, that they have agreed to partner with the other towns? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Good to know. your chance, Lindley. All right. <laughs> I would move uh, to support the letter of intent for the working community's challenge grant. Sure. All in favor? Aye. 
Thank you all Thank you. for being on the link support. You really have been so game to let us try some things to make sure Please do pass along any ideas and thoughts you have about direction. Thank you. It's nice to meet you, Josh. Thanks for coming in. It is. It really is. They did a beautiful job when they did that, for sure. Very nice. So we had um, kind of carry over from the last meeting. Um, we had uh, the approval of two new members to the Conservation Commission, and last time we had had decided to table it based upon that there was no letter of interest um, from the parties to stay with our formal process. Um, we have received, I, I believe you, I believe we all got one. Yeah, in the one was in the packet. I got the other one. Um, I just got the other one, so we're all set. And Therese says that she got the other letter of interest yep. today. So who was the other one? William Chris Chris or Chris William Chris Fors. Yeah. And Chris, you have the um, terms from Mary. Yeah, so the, um, so I would, ex let's see, I would um, entertain a motion to uh, move forward with the approval of two members of the Conservation Commission. The first one being Danny Dover uh, for a three-year term, and then Chris Spores for the two-year term. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 On that. And, and we have the operations and maintenance agreement for grant purchases. Yep, this looking is, hard at your leaf blower again? Yeah, this is, <laughs> it's funny, we look at the bottom, all the things they want, you know, and this is part of it is basically that you are certifying that we purchased it, which we did, mm. and, um, and that we commit to maintaining the equipment according to manufacturer's specifications. So we have to attach all this stuff. You see items one through five that were in your packet. So. Yeah, I guess I was confused because we, because I thought we had made a motion. You had made a motion for them to go, well, this is oh. saying, this is another one that, this is them saying that not, yes, you may approve the purchase and approve the grant, but this is you saying that you, the legislative body, certified that we will, that they'll maintain the equipment. Oh, well, you, <laughs> you might want to get the boys in here. <laughs> make them sign on the line. I don't know. I'll see what about you. I'll see if they good. That's right. I don't know if that, unless it's going to be parked at my house, I don't know if I'm going <laughs> to. Oh, we'll let them know, but uh, that's the deal, so. In order to get our reimbursement, that's what we got to do. All right, so I would entertain a motion to allow Therese on our behalf to sign for the leaf blower. Yeah. I actually think you grant acceptance. Yeah. All so I need is a second. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor? Okay. Aye. Trees. All right, so, all right. Who did the motion? I think I did. Yeah, she did it. Yeah, that's good. Trees. All right, I like it. All right. And we have the select board meeting minutes of the 24th. Which is really the 21st. What? Oh, you're right. Oh, thank you. We're still off, huh? <laughs> we can't get it together. 23rd to the 24th to the 21st. Okay. That's right. And I think we adjourned at 7.55 as opposed to 6.55. Oh, yeah. Okay. If Perfect. we got out at 6.55, it would be a long time to get home. Did it? <laughs> All right, excellent. I'll fix that. Thank you. Was there anything else on there? I don't know. That was it. Oh, that was it. Okay. I would entertain a motion to accept the meeting minutes as amended. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, there was um, meeting minutes in there for the Bethel's Planning Commission. 
guess it's nice to see that um, that they have some attendees now. I think for a while they were down to like a group of two, if I remember right. Well, they're still not that many. Yeah, <laughs> These guys are still from other places. Yeah, these are visitors. Yeah, these these are visitors. visitors. So I think there's only three. They're still, they're still larger. They're up to three. And that's true. They still only have three. Yeah. yeah. Do we have, when's the last time we've taken out any um, advertisements in regards to, you know, a list of... Oh, in the newspaper? I don't know. that are open, you know... I think Kelly had done them before she left, but I'll have to... Or, we can do one another one. Facebook one. Flash yeah, or something. Yeah, I'll let them cross, because, it's, know, because it's not just the planning commission, so... No, planning commission, the rec committee yep. is, you know, what is rec committee? Three, I think? Yes, yeah. it is. Um, I think they've got it up to four. Re on the rec committee? Yeah, because they have Ellie, Shane, Thatcher, Dietrich. All right, so just I the think four. They, all the way up to four. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, I mean, I'm not still, sure I mean, a healthy right committee is usually five or six. Oh, individuals. exactly. So, so planning, rec, what about the <coughs> visioning committee? Is that still? <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know. It hasn't gone anywhere. Long. I didn't know. Um, so let's see. Oh. Conservation, she's done pretty well. Conservation yeah. was. It's pretty full now. Yeah. Is that? You got two, two. Energy committee, I think they got a couple. Yeah, so, yeah these are pretty well full too, isn't it? Okay. And I'm not sure about the, um, the what, do you, what about your DRV? And yeah, they're, yeah, they're, 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 they're pretty good? Yeah, they still got it. One, two, I couldn't three, remember. four, five. Okay. <clears throat> then I'll put out the planning. And I think, still on that, so, yeah. wasn't there one in here for the energy? Committee. I feel like I saw something that Jose had put in, right? Well, it's, it's a, they're seeking volunteer members. There's also the town <coughs> committee. Um, and they seem like, four, which I think they normally have four. Yeah, I think they have a couple more that haven't been there. Um, so, dumb question on the, the town committee, uh, town meeting committee. So they're looking at putting together an 80 or 90 page um, Publication. Yeah, they actually aren't just, they're almost, they're done. It's in the. Yeah. <laughs> so is that, that's funded through the budget, through the general fund? No. Right now it's, uh, they, they've just been working on it forever. It's something that they had asked us if we could link it to our, you know, web page and how we could do that. They haven't, I have not been approached yet about printing it or anything like that because okay. it is a sizable document. Rick will talk to Spalding Press about the cost of printing it mm -hmm. in, the, in the minutes here. So. Yeah, so I'm not so, sure. Maybe once okay. he does that, he'll come to, with Price to, to talk about it. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, I've never attended one of their meetings. I'm not sure where they're okay. thinking of okay. certainly okay. linking it. Because we've talked about even, um, as I talked with Lindley and Deidre and I talking about, you know, a letter, like welcoming people. And then, and she said yeah. this was what that... Um, you know, for sure. I'm not sure if the intent was going to be to mail it to every new resident that moved in or just yeah, kind of make it available. What their intent was just more of a, I mean, they're calling it an operator's manual, Bethel operator's manual. So yeah. the how to's of living in Bethel. Right. Right. So it might be nice if we even, even if we do a welcome letter to new residents when they move in, the town clerk gets that from the PTR. We could always include a link to it since it's going to be on the website to say, hey, you know, here's a. There's that, but it's a neat idea, and they've been putting a lot of work, and I know I've edited some of it, Kelly has. And well, 80 to 90 pages is going to be a, a cost involved. In Absolutely, yeah. I, so I, have, I don't know. I have not been approached yet, so I'm not sure what to tell you. What that, how that lands in the budget. Yeah, right now, I don't know. I haven't heard. I move that we uh, move the next meeting to the 12th or to so the 11th. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. All right. Will you be able to attend that, Lisa, or will we have to? If they move it to a Tuesday. Will you be able to attend on a Tuesday? Uh, on the 12th? Uh, or would it, we it have to take that? It might be tight, because that's staff meeting day, so. Just um, let me know. Hmm? Let's let me know if you can. Yeah, yeah. I'll take the minutes. Yeah. Of course. So, um, what about the following week? And then it's, so the second and fourth, so it works out okay for the. For Thanksgiving, okay, that works out good. What if you look ahead, Chris? Do you have December in there? Just since we're talking about it, 
Do you have any issues with the holidays for December, how that works? The 2nd and 4th or the 9th and the 23rd. Perfect. That's fine. If it's the first year, we normally have to move it around the end of December. Mm -hmm. yeah, it becomes sure. a challenge. <clears throat> So um, then we'll add some extra meetings, though, for budgets meetings, or do you not um, try uh, to do them last year if we added an extra? We haven't, we haven't in the past, but not to say that Might we be won't if, if we get behind or something yeah. like that. I'll have stuff for the next meeting, so um, I'll have a few departments for the next meeting. So yeah. we know it might be all right, but if not, it might be something to throw in there is to do one, and that would be the only thing on the, on the agenda. So we'll take a peek at it. But, um, I'm trying. I'm going to set up a meeting with the fire department. I'll have fire, listers, clerk, municipal. So I'll be able to work out quite a bit of the general. Fund. So I think normally in the past we started off with what public works. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm not sure. We, we started off with public works, right? Roll that out, and then well, we had to whittle that two or three times. I think we had to. Yeah. And, then, and then we get into well, I, this fire year constable. We're not going to start with public works this year. I decided that already. <laughs> I just, I just. I can just, for me to get stuff ready for the next meeting is going to be more of the general fund budget. And then I can, that'll buy me a little bit of time. I can, because that's, you know, Lister, Municipal, I mean, it's a big chunk of, mm -hmm. of the budget. So I can get that fire and stuff, I think, done for the next one. And um, so then I'll sit down with Alan and work. So I did want to say, too, that Mo and Mo, AJ, and Jason had attended a training. And I'm going to give you some of that. Um, AJ was kind enough to print me out the material Alan had taken it last year, I think. So um, there was, it was good information about salt versus sand. And I read it um, last night and had made some notes. So there are some pieces of it, not the entire you know, presentation, but there are some sections of it that I thought would be interesting, especially because we've had this conversation about less salt, more sand. And, and this gentleman in this presentation, you could speak to that, Mo, had some interesting things to say about that. Um, while we certainly still have more gravel than pavement, um, and there's still room for us to probably save money in salt, it gave some neat tips about wetting the salt and things like that, and, and certainly calibrating the equipment and, and things. So I actually have a meeting with the road crew on Wednesday. So. The speed is, you know, when you calibrate, you, you've got to calibrate to one speed and, and stick with that speed. Yes. Not 40 or 30. Right, exactly. And the, the presentation was really like a PowerPoint presentation, but it was really interesting. Like I said, I read it last night. I have a meeting with the road crew um, on Wednesday at 9, so I'm going to go over some of this again with them. And I talked to the road foreman today about changing routes and, and that the expectation is that, you know, Camp Brook will not be plowed with a one ton. and. So we're going to be changing up some some routes, and so we'll have a we have a set aside time on Wednesday to meet with the road crew. So this meeting that we went to, it, it dealt mostly with with pavement and salt. There was, mm -hmm. was very little on gravel. Yep. But he had some good suggestions there too. Yeah, and then the salt stuff was really interesting too. I thought, and um, AJ had you know he had told me about it. You had told me about it, and then so I said, hey, you want to. AJ's like, yeah, I'll print it out for you. And then I said, and then once I saw some really, there was some interesting charts in there that talked about it. I said, oh, I definitely will give some of this to the select board. So um, you're not going to be here for one meeting, but I'll make sure it's the meeting that you're here for. Yeah. So that would be great. Can I ask a quick budget question in my, from my other role as the, the library? Question. Sure. <laughs> um, I think the library is supposed to submit a letter or a request or something to, OK. Is there a timeline for which that needs to get to you? Um, no. It would be, you know, early December would be great. Okay. I love because that's really, that's just for their appropriation, right? Yeah, it's. Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, then that's, that's a, well, they don't come in front of your committee, right? No. They're just part of the budget. So yeah, basically, as soon as you can get it to me, it would be lovely. Okay. And um, right. then we can do that. And, and um, we've already started talking a little bit about town report and, Okay. Kelly has already um, started working on okay. that a little bit too. Okay, so. great. I see Doug signed up for another 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a discount too. <laughs> what a year. It's a rumor. Well, so. That's funny. I believe it. Well, enjoy your retirement. Thank you, stranger. All the good years we got. Thank you for all the good years we got. <laughs>
was actually pretty good. We got everything where he had everybody to get him to sign it, I think. So. Yeah. Right, is there anything else to come before the board? No, we're, we've been, it seems like every Monday we've been here lately, so <laughs> I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved.